I'm, uh, I'm excited because I'm not going to be teaching tonight. Actually, uh, we have a, a guest speaker, uh, our very own Michael Fuel. And so if you could give him a hand, he's going to come up and share the message. Thank you, Brandon. Pastor Brandon. Well, it's an honor and a privilege to be able to share some time in God's word with you all this evening. Uh, my prayer is that the Lord speak to each one of your lives, that he transform you and renew you this evening. Uh, so today, it marks the day of Christ's crucifixion. And so we're just going to go through a few points and a few prominent figures uh, that Christ influenced in his life, the, the change that that his glory, his sacrifice, and what we'll find out on Sunday, his resurrection, what that means for all of us. But before we get into it tonight, let's go ahead and begin in a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you for this evening. We thank you for your glory, your grace, for allowing us to gather together, Lord, in a free country which allows us to just go through your word, Lord, to study it freely, Lord, to proclaim your truth. We pray that you'd give us boldness, strength, and the ability to go out into this world, Lord, and proclaim your goodness, your truth, the truth of what we're going to be reading about today to everyone around us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So today we're going to be starting off in the Gospel of John. We're going to be starting off in the Gospel of John, and it'll be beginning in chapter 18, verse 2. 28. So while you guys turn there, let me introduce you to myself. Uh, for those of you who do not know me, I'm Michael. I graduated a couple years back from Calvary Bible Institute. It's out there, way out in, they call it the, the back of the desert. So um, it's all, you think Hemet's a desert, you go to Joshua Springs and you'll find that there's no grass. Uh, you got to be wealthy, a millionaire to have some grass. So, yeah, it's, it's the end of the desert. And so uh, I graduated from there, but I'll tell you, that was an awesome, amazing time. The Lord really worked in my life and the lives of the students around me while I was there. So uh, wrapping that up, I now can uh, consistently attend Calvary Chapel University. I do that online. And it's just going through God's word and practical application of how I can further uh, grow in the Lord in my life. So that's a little bit about me. Um, but now, <laughs> so now more about Good Friday. What is this day? Well, this holy day, holiday, commemorates the sacrifice of the perfect, blameless, innocent son of God, Jesus Christ. John S. Kieran, the manager of one news article, stated that roughly 63% of proclaiming Christians view this day with a high regard for its significance. Biblically, this, is, this event is the centerpiece to the long-lasting narrative of salvation, and it is key to the dominating testament of God's love for us. As we take a look at this historical day, I would like to focus on three prominent individuals in this event, and the effect Jesus' life and his suffering had on their lives. The first individual we will look at is the man whose name is translated son of the father. His name, Barabbas, known as a liar, a thief, and even an insurrectionist, this man was set to pay for his crimes with his life. Now, back in this day, Rome was eager to control political uprisings, so one method they would use to do so was crucifixion. This was arguably one of the most grotesque methods of execution in history. But more than this, it was a public display that was meant to deter the mere thought of rebellion. It proved effective, and since its estimated implementation in the third century before Christ, it had effectively ended several potential uprisings. One remark from the Roman lawyer Cicero in roughly 76 BC gives us a real sense of the impact crucifixion had on spectators. And I'll quote, let the very word cross be far removed from not only the bodies of Roman citizens, but even from their thoughts, their eyes, and their ears. 
That way we know a little bit more about the punishment, not only from the bodies of the Roman citizens, that, that it would not be even removed from their sight, that it was such a horrible method of death. Let's take a look at Barabbas's life. Let's take a look at Jesus' life and see how this event turns. John chapter 18, verse 28 through 38 read, Then they led Jesus from Caiaphas to the praetorium, and it was early morning, but they themselves did not go into the praetorium, lest they be defiled, but that they might eat the Passover. And so Pilate went, went out to them, what accusation, and said, what accusation do you bring against this man? Notice their deflection regarding this inquiry. They are not being, they, they don't want to reflect, uh, say anything against the law. And so their answer to them is going to be very interesting. Their answer is, they answered and said to him, if he were not an evildoer, he would have not delivered, we would have not delivered him to, up to you. Then Pilate said to them, you take him and judge him according to your law. Therefore the Jews said to him, it is not lawful for us to put anyone to death, that the saying of Jesus might be fulfilled, which he spoke, signifying what death he would die. Then Pilate entered the praetorium again, called Jesus and said to him, are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered him, are you speaking for yourself about this, or did others tell you this concerning me? Pilate answered, I am a Jew for your nation, and am I a Jew for your own nation? And the chief priests have delivered you to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight so that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now my kingdom is not from here. That's interesting that the whole aspect of Jesus' reign, his rule, and his time here on earth, it was not, when he first came, it wasn't for ruling and dictating. It wasn't to save the Jews. It wasn't to take them out of their tyranny of Rome, as we'll get into later. But more, it was to serve, to seek to serve and to save those who were lost. And that is what his kingdom was. It wasn't in this world. It was out of this world. That's what we come to find is like he said, but now my kingdom is not from here. So Pilate, therefore it said to him, are you a king then? Jesus answered, you say rightly that I am a king. For this cause I was born and for this cause I have come into the world that I should bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. Pilate said to him, what is the truth? And when he had said this, he went out again to the Jews and said to them, I find no fault in him at all. So I'd like to imagine the, what Pilate was going through in his head. In another gospel, we find that his wife was troubled by a dream concerning this man. And so, of course, that's going to be in the back of his head that, okay, I got to deal correctly with this situation. I don't want to take uh, and anger the crowds because as we come to find, Barabbas was one of those key figures that they were trying to um, lift up to get them out of the tyranny of Rome. And so he doesn't want to just anger the crowds. He doesn't want to make an uprising again, which is one of the reasons why they brought uh, crucifixion in the first place to Rome. So he's going to be very careful with how he does this. And he, so he's, of course, studying Jesus. He's asking him these questions. And uh, we find in John that he, Jesus gives a very correct answer as he always does and uh, he says like he said you say rightly that I am a king for this cause I was born repeating again and for this cause I have come into the world that I should bear witness to the truth everyone who was of the truth hears my voice unlike Barabbas Jesus was uniquely humble you see unlike an earthly ruler Jesus was here for a different purpose more information regarding this truth Jesus speaks of may be found in Mark's Gospel, chapter 10. Here we find a request given for two sons, James and John, that they might sit at Jesus' right hand in his new kingdom. 
It is at the end of his response to this request that we find Jesus' true humility in the mission he came for. So I'll go ahead and read from Mark chapter 10, verse 45. It clarifies, For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life a ransom for many. Jesus should by all rights be first in his kingdom, and yet he had led a life of servanthood. That is impossible for us to mimic in our own strength. Jesus rightly had no fault. His humility in response to Pilate's questions further exasperates the religious leaders so they were, who were seeking for a deliverance from the tyranny of Rome, and so their ideal Messiah would not be that of a knight shining in armor. It would be of a knight shining in armor, and you can picture that in typical fantasy films. However, this was not the purpose of Jesus' mission. He came not to do, deliver the Jews from the tyranny of Rome, but to deliver from the tyranny of sin and death. This task was no easy feat, as it would require the atonement of all of humanity's sin, past, present, and future, to be paid in full. Barabbas is a fitting example of such atonement, Let's take a look at the next two verses in John, picking it up in verse 39. But you have a custom that I should release someone to you at the Passover. Do you therefore want me to release you to you, the king of the Jews? Then they all cried again, saying, not this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a robber. See, the people knew the man Barabbas more than all his heinous misdeeds for being a leader of an attempted revolt against the Roman government. They knew him for being an insurrectionist, one that they approved of. Pilate likely thought that one who had committed such disgraceful crimes would be unanimously condemned by the crowd over an innocent man. However, this was not the case. Upon a further attempts to release Jesus, Pilate ultimately decided to release to the crowd uh, Barabbas by allowing Jesus' crucifixion. John 19, 15 through 16 says, But they cried out, Away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priests answered, we have no king but Caesar. Then he delivered to them to be crucified. So they took Jesus and led him away. Jesus was not the only one sentenced to death. He was sentenced with the same judgment set to be placed on Barabbas. This leads us to our next fellow who we'll be studying, and um, that one would be named Simon. No, not Simon Peter, but rather Simon the Cyrenian. You might ask, who is Simon the Cyrenian? Well, we find that he is uh, in the crowd when Jesus has uh, just got through being scourged and he's walking through the city uh, taking his cross. One of the centurions will take him and tell him to carry Jesus' cross. So we'll get into that um, in Luke's Gospel, chapter 23, verse 26. Now, as they led him away, they laid hold of a certain man, Simon the Cyrenian, who was coming from the country, and on him they laid the cross that he might bear it after Jesus. Now, a Roman citizen, centurion had the authority to compel any Jewish or non-Roman citizen to carry a load for up to one mile. Simon ended up carrying that cross for roughly three quarters of a mile. I wonder what that must have been like in the presence of Jesus Christ carrying that cross right aside him. It is speculated that Simon would go on to become a prominent figure in the early church, as his sons Alexander and Rufus are mentioned in Mark's gospel. And if you want to look that up, that's Mark 15, 21. Slowing down now, let's take a look at our last individual, starting in verse 32. There were also two others, criminals, led with him to be put to death. And when they had come to this place called Calvary, here they crucified him. And the criminals, one on the right hand and the other on the left, then Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. 
and they divided his garments and cast lots, and the people stood looking on. But even the rulers with them sneered, saying, He saved others, let him save himself, if he is the Christ, the chosen of God. The soldiers also mocked him, coming and offering him sour wine and saying, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. And an inscription also was written over him in the letters of Greek, Latin, and Hebrew. This is the king of the Jews, the one of the criminals who were hanged, blaspheming him, saying, If you are the Christ, save yourself and us. But the others answered him and rebuked him, saying, Do you not even fear God, seeing you are under the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward for our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said to Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said to him, Assuredly, I say to you, you will be with me in paradise. That's a powerful statement. How often we go through life and we, we live our lives for ourselves. We walk through life seeking what we can gain out of earthly profit. We can see, I make this investment, I get this in return, and I can keep growing my own wealth, but where does that end? It ends in death. You see, this criminal on the cross, this thief, whatever he was put up there for, he recognized the true glory of Christ. He recognized his humility, and most of all, he recognized that he was God. He recognized that he was not worthy to be on the cross, yet he decided to go up there of his own volition and sacrifice himself for the good of all humanity. Two men were presented on crosses either side of Jesus. One admitted his own guilt, recognized Jesus for who he is, and requested merely to be remembered. The other mocked him alongside the soldiers. While we don't know the reasons for either of the sentenced criminals, we can learn from their interactions with the Messiah. We can see that true conviction and humility of the one who requested to be remembered, and he received much more than he had hoped. Let's read that again in verse 43. And Jesus said to him, Assuredly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. While the repentant criminal received salvation, here we hear no response from Jesus as to those mocking him, aside from his previous words in verse 34. Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. Let's take a look at a last little bit of scripture, verses 44 through 49. Now it was about the sixth hour, and there was a darkness all over the earth until the ninth hour. Then Jesus uh, then the sun was darkened, and the veil of the temple was torn in two. And when Jesus had cried out with a loud voice, he said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Having said this, he breathed his laugh, last. So when the centurion saw what had happened, he glorified God, saying, Certainly this was a righteous man. And the whole crowd who came together to that sight, seeing what had been done, beat their breasts and returned. But all his acquaintances and the woman who followed him from Galilee stood at a distance watching these things. To the end, Christ was committed to completing his plan for humanity's salvation. And he suffered many things, betrayal, persecution, scorn, slander, and even death. Yet he saw all of us as an, all of it as an insignificant price compared to the love he had for us and his desire to be with us. I can't imagine that scene on Calvary. Jesus is right there next to the two criminals on the crosses and the centurions mocking him alongside everyone else. And this one centurion that we read of that he recognizes after Jesus dies, this was a truly, he was. He glorified God and certainly he was a righteous man. You see, if I put myself in my, that position, if I was crucified on the cross, I did nothing wrong. I was taking the place of others, which, by the way, wouldn't 
be enough to care, cover anyone else's sins, let alone my own, sacrificing my own life. It's only God's life, his sacrifice, that saves us should we believe in him. But put myself in that shoes, in those shoes, and I look from a third-person perspective. How easy would it be for myself to ridicule those? Or if I had the power to come down, would that temptation be so great as I would? I can't say that I, uh, that I would be able to stay up there of my own strength. See, the Lord, he, he was God. He's omnipotent. He created the whole world. Just look at the Genesis story. You see, there's tons of people who will say, tell you, well, the earth just, the whole universe came out of a big bang. Well, I would say, well, that's kind of interesting because that's still something. God created everything out of nothing. And that same God who created the entire universe, who created you, who created me, he decided that even though we chose to despise him, we chose to live our lives apart from him, we chose to live 40, 50, 20 years apart from him, he was always there with open arms and ready to receive us. That's the kind of love Christ has for us. That's what we see on the cross. And we'll come to find out on Sunday how good Friday is. Christ had no reason other than his love to sacrifice himself for us. And how encouraging that is in my own life. When I look at myself from a third-person perspective, by no means am I worthy of anyone's eyes to be saved. Yet Christ sees me as his precious lamb that he would do anything for. Even if it was just me in the entire world, he would sacrifice himself. That's so strong. You see, I've talked to a few people on the street. I've talked to friends and family who don't quite believe. They don't think that it's all that something to be after. Come on, it's just a joke. Why do you believe that? Well, the truth is, I would rather believe in the inspired word of God who 40 authors throughout 600 plus years and more wrote all inspired through the Holy Spirit and it all points from Genesis to Revelation. It points to this one moment to the sacrifice Christ made on the cross and his resurrection. You see, I don't believe it's a coincidence that there are so many cross references in the Bible, especially when there is 40 plus authors of the book. And if I had the choice to choose between believing there's nothing, that I'm here for no reason at all, I have no purpose in this life other than existing and dying, gaining wealth, and then leaving it for my family. Or between a creator who from before I was born, before the foundations of this world, he thought of me. He made me. He brought me here for such a time as this, and he loved me. And that he did all this, he placed me where, in the situations I've gone through, the, through the hard times, through the tough times, through the good times, he placed me here to do his work. And wherever that is in my life, I would, of course, choose the side of the creator who loves me. In my mind, there's no doubt that the Bible is true. But even if there was doubt, by common, just looking at the facts presented, I would have to believe that the word of God is true. Yeah. Wrapping it up. <clears throat> Romans 5.8 says, But God demonstrates his own love towards us, and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. That's the love he has for us. Notice that it says demonstrates. Not demonstrated. What Christ did for us should be a living reminder, a continual reminder of our daily walks, our daily lives. That not only that he loves us,
but that we can receive that love. We have the ability to believe in that love and accept it. Just as you can reject someone in this world for uh, their love towards you, you can reject Christ's love. That's true. But I choose to accept it. There's no sin too big for his payment. Just as Barabbas was set free, so are we set free from eternity apart from God. All that is left for us is to confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, we will be saved. Romans 10, 9. Once you have found that love Christ has always had for you, you will find the peace and joy that allows you to stand firm carrying your own cross daily, running the race with all humility. The best part about it all is that the only price we pay for our daily submission to Christ is submission. And is that really a price? To me, it's a privilege. You see, I look at my life in the lens of an overview picture, like I'm just a piece in the puzzle. And I have two options. I can live my life for myself, gain for myself. I could even be in the ministry and I could still live it for myself. Or I could be submissive. Now, that doesn't mean I'm going to get all this good stuff. No, far from it. We're told that more often than not, we're going to come against tribulation, trials and tribulations. But we are told that we're to count it all joy when various trials come our way. What is joy? Joy simply is having not happiness, but love, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, justice, and self-control in the midst of trials that come our way. You can be happy when times are great, but when tough times come your way, when you don't know if you're going to pay your rent, you don't know where you're going to live, you don't know if you are going to be evicted next week, you still can know and have faith that Christ is with you if you accept him as your Lord. And you see, just as we see several people, including Paul, go through his life following the Lord's instruction, we find John ends up on an island. They tried to boil him alive and he didn't die. He suffered through countless things. Paul actually had all the sufferings that he would have come his way stated to him before he would suffer them. And he still walked the path of the righteous. That doesn't mean that he was perfect, but it means he was continually washed by the blood of Christ, the sacrifice he made on Calvary for his sins. That same blood that was shed for Paul and allowed him to do miraculous things in the name of Jesus as the servant of the Lord has been washed over me, has been washed over you. If you've chosen to accept him as your savior, we found that it was that simple. Romans 10, 9, I'll repeat it again, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. On Sunday, we will come to find the miraculousness of what Christ did being raised from the dead. But to me, it's no surprise. He's God. He did that for me. He did that for you. And despite the challenges that come our way, I pray that you not lose focus on Christ's centrality in your life. That you wouldn't stray to the left or to the right. That you would stay fire focused on Christ and his plan for you. You don't have to be as young as me. You can be younger or older. Christ always has a plan and a purpose for those who are alive and walking in this moment. Countless times I've heard it said, and Pastor Kerry says it all the time, you were born for such a time as this. 
And I truly believe that. I believe that there is a revival. I believe that it is our duty to spread the gospel. And yes, it can be stressful. It can be challenging to put ourselves out there. But it's not us that's doing the work. It's Christ. He loves us. He's given us the strength to proclaim the good news. And that's, that's all more than what I can imagine. I'm unworthy for that. The best part about it all is the only price we pay is submission. Let's make that a privilege. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you for this evening, Lord. We thank you for the salvation that we can find in you, Lord. We thank you for your mercy, Lord. We may even fall daily. We fall hourly. We say something we shouldn't have to someone else. We do something we know we shouldn't have. Lord, we know that you've sacrificed yourself, Lord. You've convicted us, Lord. We recognize that it is simply confessing with our mouth, Lord, and believing in our hearts that you died for us, and that you were resurrected by God, that we'll be saved, Lord. I'm forever grateful for that, Lord, and I pray that you continually remind me and everyone else in this room of the grace you've shown to each and every one of us. We thank you and we praise you. In Jesus' name we pray.